Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast today from Santa Cruz in California, a lovely place. I've been there. <laughs> uh, Anne Jansa, who's the founder of Cuesta Park Consulting and is a nonfiction book coach, and she's also author of six books about writing and marketing. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Anne. It's a great uh, privilege to have you here as my guest. Thanks for having me, Jürgen. I'm thrilled to be here. Wonderful. Now, Mark Hirschberg, who was our guest on episode 565 of the Innova Buzz podcast, introduced us and suggested that we have a conversation. So, big hello to Mark. Yes. Thank you, Mark. He's wonderful. <laughs> mm, he is. Yeah. And we had a great conversation on that episode as well. Now, you're fascinated by human behavior and cognitive science, which is sort of an area that I've always been fascinated by. And you're looking, always looking for clues about how we can communicate more effectively based on an understanding of, of cognitive science and of human behaviour. So I'm really looking forward to digging into that some more today and particularly in light of some of the things that are happening in our world at this time. Uh, Indeed. <laughs> before, before we do that, and what's the impact you're making in the world today? I like to think that on a small scale or larger scale, I'm helping people connect uh, and communicate more empathetically and, and get their ideas across more effectively. That's my little hope to make the world a slightly better place bit by bit. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love the idea of the empathetic communication. And um, what what do you mean by that? Because I, that term's used a lot these days. and he, you know, the it, whole idea of uh, emotional intelligence and empathy. Um, yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean, it's actually pretty simple when it comes to writing. Uh, I, I, I like to talk about this idea of servant authorship, I call it, which is we're writing to serve other people. Um, so often when we write, we're just in our own heads so much. It's like, here's what I want to say. Here's how I want to say it. Here's how I want to sound, right? I mean, this is how we start, of course, is natural. And yet the real trick to good writing is to then say, okay, what, but who's reading in this and what do they need to hear from me? And how do they need me to show up? Um, and then how do I change what I do based on that? So I think really good writing is usually an act of being empathetic with the reader. Um, and it's so easy to lose sight of that when we're just focused on what we want to say. Um, mm. So I, I've done a lot of looking at, you know, why, why does metaphor work? Well, it works because of the effect it has in the reader's brain, right? It brings in visual systems or sensory systems, and now you're talking to more of their brain. This is a kind of, when we talk about the psychology of writing or something, that's what I'm particularly fascinated in is what you know, how do we fundamentally communicate and how does that work? It's a fascinating topic. Yeah, 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 I love it. Yeah, the, well, the idea um, of what you've described there as empathetic communication and, and what does our listener or reader, I'm thinking podcast already, what does our reader exactly. need to hear from me or need to read from me in terms of this topic where I think I have something to contribute. Um, that philosophy, I think, goes across the board of whether we're doing a podcast, which is where I went unconsciously. <laughs> of whether, course. Whether we're um, presenting or presenting a speech in front of an audience, whether we're pitching to investors or pitching to potential customers, right? Yeah. And And yeah. as you said, in those situations, quite often we're in our own heads thinking, oh, how do I sound or do I? Do they think I'm stupid? You know, or... it's, it's natural. I mean, I, I challenge people this and anyone listening, this is a little empathy exercise you can do every single day. As soon as you write an email, before you send it, go back and look at the first sentence or two. And in nine times out of 10, it's I. I wanted to say, I had to reach out and da, da, da. I did this. That's what we write about. It's what we know. What happens if you change that sentence to have the reader be the subject? Mm -hmm. You should know about this thing because it affects your project. Okay. Now, if I'm reading an email like that, I'm going to pay attention, right? I'm going to sit okay. up and the, this is about me. You know, we're all our own favorite subject. So just do this little thing where you change your first line of every email that you write and see what happens. This is just the simplest way to add empathy to your writing. 
Mm, yeah, they are. Well, there's a golden tip. <laughs> yeah, off yep. the bat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Early on, yeah. All right. Well, um, one of the things that I know you're very strong on is is brand voice, and this kind of leads into some of the things that I want to explore later on as well. The idea of brand voice and and my kind of view of this is that in from a marketing point of view if somebody reads that email for example and they haven't met me they don't know me it might be a cold outreach email but something lands with them mm -hmm. and so they get in touch with me and there's a follow-up communication of some sort and to me the brand voice or the, the the good brand voice is the one where after that email and that second contact the person who contacts me says yes that's exactly what i was expecting that's exactly the that's exactly consistent with what my first impression was yes um, and then and then as they get to know me personally and as they read more of my information, watch more of my videos, listen to more of my podcasts, they say, yeah, that's everything's consistent. So explain to us, well, am I on the right track there? And explain to us how do we how do we kind of make sure that our whole our personal brand and our business brand is all aligned and has that consistency? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the challenge, especially if you're, um, so, so you speak, you know, if you're a, a if you're a solopreneur, your brand voice is your voice, right? Mm. If you're, if we were a two person company, Anne and Jurgen, people would expect to get things from Anne or Jurgen. That'd be fine. They get that. But once you're more than three or four, uh, people expect, you know, we almost create a vision of a brand in our head as much as we do the people. So mm. when I get a little like an invoice from you, I mean, does it, just it does it have your personality and it? it doesn't have to but a shipping notice or a you know a reminder notice and things is really a wonderful marketing up marketing opportunity to embed your voice in all of your interactions um because if you think about it so my my marketing book i wrote was about how we need to stop thinking of customers in a subscription based world we have to start thinking about marketing as engaging and supporting the entire ongoing relationship, not just getting to the sale and then washing our hands of the customer, <laughs> yeah. which, which sadly marketing uh, often does. Yeah. Um, so, so, so the relationship is what matters and, and you can actually add value to the thing you're selling by adding value to that relationship. Mm -hmm. And in fact, people, you know, people can start, you know, people, there are a cabillion book coaches in the world, right? I mean, I'm not doing anything that's, unique in that sense. What is different is the relationships that I form with the people I coach with. It, it, it's what's fundamental to me is what the difference is. Very easy for people to copy what you do, very hard for them to copy the relationships that you form. And one aspect, especially when you're operating at scale, is that voice that you present, is that when, when you're not physically there, your words are representing you in a way that, as you said, is consistent with who you are and what you value. So that's yeah. the importance of brand voice, you know, on, on the big scale, like for the giant companies versus, you know, and, and all the way down to the individual coaches and things. Yes, very important. Yeah, well, you said something there that uh, kind of is, is a big hobby horse of mine and it's around the idea of relationship and that the, um, yeah, the, the transaction of the sale isn't the end of the customer journey. Exactly. It's, it continues after that. So I, I talk um, in my marketing frameworks, I talk about that being kind of only the midpoint yes. or, or maybe a key inflection point of, of the customer journey, but there's so much more after that. And um, most, I think most businesses still fail to grasp that. They it's do. Like, okay, we've it's, made the sale, we're done. <laughs> they have this funnel, it goes to the tiny point and then it stops. Yeah. You know, it's like, we don't care what happens after the funnel. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't I don't think it's a funnel. If you do it well, it's a French horn. It feeds back on itself. It's complicated. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's not a, yeah, that's yeah, that's well, great. I, I, I say it's a flywheel. <laughs> if, I like it, flywheel, that's cause better. It, yeah, because <laughs> it, actually, it actually builds its own momentum if you do it right. Yes, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and yet, and yet... 
you know, and chasing the new, the, the new, new lead, the new, new, next new client, you mm-hmm. know, customer, we, we, we forget we, that, you know, the success comes from our current, from our current subscribers and customers as well. So, mm-hmm. yep. Keep preaching. You keep yep. preaching, Jurgen. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. The, um, now brand and writing voice. So you're a writing coach. You help people write books. The uh, the big thing, I guess, in in this space and the elephant in the room, if you like, is AI and and the uh, generative, yeah, uh, predictive transformers, whatever they call the GPT, the Chat GPT type yep. products, and all the all the iterations of those, all the things that are being built on top of those to help people write, essentially produce content. How? How do you see that playing into what you do? How do you see um, that? Can that help? Can that hinder? Um, particularly yes and in the yes. Light of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was going to go, particularly in the light of what we've just been talking about, which is building relationships with our customers. Right, right. And there's so much to unpack in this. Um, you know, a, a, a generative AI something like chat gpt can um definitely help people write it can help them ideate it could even help them um come up with or understand the voice you know you could you can give chat gpt a sample of your writing and say please describe this writing in terms of tone style rhetorical devices whatever you know so you can actually kind of quantify mm-hmm. what you're doing um which is interesting uh, and I think there's ways to help it to say, okay, now make it funnier and see what it does, you know, or now make it more serious or more authoritative, you know, see what it does. We can learn, uh, use this to learn what to do. However, I don't want to, you know, I think if we honestly think of this as a relationship that we are forming with our customers and our prospects, um, I don't want to cede my half of that relationship to to a piece of software. So I also think, you know, at the basis of the relationship is trust. Um, and I think we need to be careful about how we uh, use this. So, so that, you know, you're going to, the thing that came to me recently was an analogy uh, that uh, I, I betray my age by saying this, but early in my young adulthood, I had, I got this cookbook on how to cook everything in a microwave because microwaves were first affordable for everybody to have. And this was exciting. So cookbook authors were like, yes, scramble your eggs, do your vegetable casserole, do the Sunday roast to do it all in the microwave. Um, and you could, you know, microwaves today are certainly in a lot of kitchens. Most kitchens, they save a lot of times. They're fantastic mm-hmm. for certain kinds of things. They're not so fantastic for other kinds of things. You know, I would not roast my beef in a, or something. You know, I, there's things that it just doesn't do well. Um, and I kind of think, and if you were a dedicated chef, you would be very sad if you had to cook everything in a microwave and had no oven, no stovetop, no grill, nothing. You just have a microwave. This would be a very sad thing. And I kind of feel like AI, when we're talking about writing, is a similar thing that, mm. um, we have to figure out what are the things it does well and where it helps us and saves us time, like melting butter. You know, I, melting butter in the microwave is fantastic. Um, yeah, right. Um, AI can do some things that are really fantastic. And I'd love to, you know, I have some great examples already and I'm experimenting every week to figure out what that is. However, I still want my words to be my own. I still am writing in my own voice. Um, uh, and I think that's how we need to all be approaching it experimentally. Um, what can it teach me? What, how can it accelerate my process? These are all great things. What insights does it give me into what my readers might be thinking? Um, so hmm. this was an interesting. If you think about how these language models are built, they're looking at patterns of language in on the web and things. So sometimes we especially if you work in technology or in an industry like, um, you know, health care or something, we have a vocabulary that may not match everybody's vocabulary, right? And so I recently tried using ChatGPT to look at keywords for a book and it came up with keywords I hadn't thought of. 
that were really good because that's words people in the online world are using yeah, yeah. to talk about so that topic. That, yeah. So yeah. it's like, that's a great use of, of that mm -hmm. to help me think more empathetically about the, the language or the vocabulary that my readers might have, you know, so there's lots of great ways to use it. Um, but I think we have to be super careful about abdicating our voices yeah. individually. Yeah, well, certainly yeah. abdicating voices, and I mean, I'm I'm really big on um, saying, you know, we're we're actually in this technological age where the tendency is to abdicate our relationship building stuff and our interactions to technology, and yeah. so I see, you know, that's like this is such a much more powerful technology than a lot of other stuff that, that we've done that to, such as email yes. marketing, for example, is one big one. Yeah. Um, so the temptation, of course, is, oh, we'll, we'll just let it do everything kind of I'll stuff. be out sitting on the and, beach. I can answer my emails. Let's go. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, um, yeah, so I see that as a real danger. And I love the microwave metaphor. So Do you? Good. A, okay. Yeah. It is a tool. And I think it's early days yet. I think there's... Uh, there's applications that will probably come out that people haven't yet explored or thought of. I've certainly stumbled upon a few that are really fascinating. And I like the, um, I'll have to try this one with analyzing the writing style. What I have done, I have explored with it, is um, take a transcript of something that I've said, even, even a conversation that I've had with people, whether it's um, on a podcast or whether it's just a casual conversation where we've um, we've recorded the conversation to later on take notes, take that conversation of some things that I've said and let ChatGPT analyze the tone and the voice and, and so on and actually pull some stuff out, uh, like write an article from this conversation, which yeah. um, has That's given amazing. me... So, some really interesting start points. I mean, I did. I then do a lot of work on that, but often those conversations in the past have, okay, there was an action. It might have been a meeting, so we took some actions out of that, made action points, dealt with those actions. But the conversation, the content, which was in there, the the question and answer stuff that was in there, that was actually really valuable to a whole to a whole audience rather than just the one person I was talking to uh, is lost. And yeah. pulling it's, that it's, out and using it in that sense, I think, can be quite helpful. It's fantastic for that. I mean, really mining things out of or giving it kind of dense things to, to summarize for us. I mean, it's a huge time saver. And like you said, it's, it's pulling out things that you might have otherwise just had disappeared into the ether. Um, I, I think it also can be a fascinating tool to use for for unblocking ourselves. You know, I, I like it as a brainstorming buddy. I, I ask it for ideas and I don't necessarily like what it comes out, but it gets me thinking. Um, there's another little story. My, I can share this. I was visiting my mom recently and she's been talking for quite some time about writing a book about some experiences in one phase of her life, but she just, you know, for various reasons, hasn't gotten to it. There's always a million reasons not to write a book, right? Um, so when we were visiting just a few weeks ago, I pulled up ChatGPT and said, let's brainstorm titles for your book, right? And we came up with a couple dozen and she was, you know, she was just highly entertained and really loved the titles. <laughs> yeah. And then I talked to her again. She's like, I started writing. I've got the whole preface done. And I'm like, and I think maybe it was seeing the titles. Maybe it was having some feedback, having some, mm. some sort of vision of, oh, wait, yes, I can start to envision this thing now, you know, so as an unblocking devices it's mm. fascinating um that might be a, another great way to use it to sort of get yourself motivated have a brainstorming buddy you know yeah as you work yeah yeah i've certainly experienced that in in lots of different ways where i've kind of hit a barrier or i've uh, found it hard to start something and I've said, oh, what, what if I engage with ChatGPT on this? And all of a sudden, yeah. it, the other thing it, it's done for me is I tend to have a lot of disparate thoughts and ideas, um, and they never get connected. I never, I never <laughs> manage to consciously connect them up and and build them into a framework that makes sense and can add value somewhere. Um, 
if I'm in that sort of phase where all this stuff's floating around in my head, I've put I've had situations where I've put that into chat GPT and it's come up and it's actually structured them. That's in fascinating. A, in a way yeah. That I then look at it and I say, oh, that's, that's, now I've got a much more concrete vision of what all these ideas, how, how they could come together and how I could do something with them. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, you know, it's, it's, we're all figuring this out on the fly. Um, week by week at this point, right? I mean, yeah. if, if maybe we'll revisit this podcast in a year and just go, ha ha, I can't believe we were saying that. <laughs> but um, yeah, but that's fascinating. Uh, it's, yeah. I would encourage anyone to, you know, experiment with it before you're writing and, and just without any sort of fear or judgment or thinking you have to take what, you know, maybe its value is spitting out something that you don't like and you realize why you don't like it and you go off in another direction. That could be a, a great value too. Just be open minded about it. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back um, and kind of transitioning from the chat GPT, you did say you can give it examples of your writing and ask it to analyze the voice, the tone, um, yeah. the language, and, and a whole lot of other yep. questions you could ask, I guess. How do, um, leaving aside chat GPT, how can we? kind of become really clear and find what our authentic voice is so that we so that we know yeah when we're writing another piece can I check that this is actually a match for my authentic voice or am I just kind of because I'm feeling particularly um I don't know particularly uh upbeat today it's it's kind of gone yeah. way over the top or if I'm feeling a bit sad today it's gone way way underneath the bottom <laughs> yeah yeah that's so interesting um because really although there is a, a you know certainly when i started chair querying about voice it, chat gpt kept coming back with authentic voice this is this thing that people are searching for and yet yeah. i think that we all obviously have multiple authentic voices and and they change and mature over time so um consistent voice though a consistent mm. If you even have a different voice, I'm going to assume, for what you send to clients versus the the chatty email you send to a family relative or, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we automatically step into different voices, but we do want to be able to step consistently into the same kind of voice um, when we're, like you said, your authentic voice for your, your business. Um, and I think that there's both, you know, so I, I think there's a set of internal levers for voice and there's a set of external ones. The external ones are to say, um, uh, I always use the pronoun you and me. I, you know, use this kind of punctuation. I have alternating sentence patterns, maybe too long, one short. You know, you can actually look and analyze this stuff on the page. Um, and it's very interesting to do. And this is the stuff that usually ends up in, um, like a style guide. If a brand has a style guide, these are the kinds of, this is how it should show up on the page things. These are the words that we use and we don't use. Um, uh, so you can look and, and have, you, you, you can look at what you normally do and see if things kind of fit that pattern. And if they've really deviated, um, if you think that you need to change that, I mean, if you've had a really down day and you're like, wow, look at how that changed. All these sentences are really long or they're all really short or I'm really angry. Look at 20 million exclamation marks. What's happening here? <laughs> you know, I mean, all caps. <laughs> clues, all caps is a definite clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> definite clue. <laughs> Walk away from the term, the keyboard. Um, <laughs> um, so there's those external levers. There's internal levers as well, which is, again, if you think hard about who you're writing for and what's your relationship with them. And that's one of my favorite ones to go to. It's like, well, I want to be a, a trusted, guided companion, or I want to be a, um, you know, uh, a supportive expert, or I want to be you know, whatever that is. Can you step back into that relationship as you write and see how that informs uh, what you're doing? Um, so that's an, another path to take is to, to make sure that you're embodying, you know, there's the, there's an old marketing exercise, I think. I don't know where I learned it, so I can't attribute to anyone. Three adjectives, you get three, pick three adjectives and this is like a branding exercise could be a personal branding exercises that we try to live by you know that that we try to show up with for our clients and in our writing um and not everything that you write is going to hit all three 
you know, this one might be more one and two, this one might be more two and three. But if you're consistently hitting those three adjectives in what you write, you will be showing up pretty consistently too. So that's another uh, fun thing. Spend some time thinking, well, what are my three adjectives? How do <laughs> I want to show up? Right. Um, that's a lot of fun. That's a fun exercise. And you can apply that sort of as a bit of a litmus test to what you've written. Now, so if you write something, you always want to be supportive, whatever. And then you've written something that's angry rant. It's like, huh, okay, well, maybe this really shouldn't go in my client stuff. It is not, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is not, it's going to undercut what I want to be. Uh, it, the, the adjective coming from this is not one of my three. So let's just put this aside or change it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, and it, I was sort of reminded. I do some of that, but uh, almost unconsciously. But I sort of realize, oh, that's a pattern that you've just described. That pattern, um, for example, I and this came up a lot in um, my using of ChatGPT when I've asked it to give me some ideas for content or give me ideas, particularly for an offer, an offer email, uh, give me ideas for something like that. It always has calls to action that go something like don't miss out yeah Bef uh fear-based yeah. fear-based marketing now that yeah yeah, or, yeah. fear-based fear yeah, yeah. marketing but yeah uh, uh sometimes it'll be not yeah it won't be really strong fear-based but it'll still say like something don't miss out don't let this opportunity pass you by something along those lines and my natural tendency is never to use that negative language because yeah. I've learned from my studies of neuroscience and that, that that the brain doesn't actually take in negative language. So that command, don't miss out, is actually the don't part is forgotten and we actually say miss out unconsciously. That's what we take in. So it's, okay, I can relax. I don't need to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I always um, rephrase those into something like if I'm doing a call to action and even if I'm putting in a time limit. So I, I will use time limits sometimes, but they're genuine. Sure. Uh, I'll say, act now. This offer expires in seven days rather right. than don't, don't miss out. Yeah. So it, and, yeah. and whenever I read something like that as a model, I always change the, the negative bit That's into a positive. A very good idea. But the, it's so interesting to me then that the fact that you have to do that every time means that the pervasive model, because these models are just yeah, learning yeah. by looking at languages out there, the pervasive exactly. model is the negative. It's the negative. So, yeah. yeah. So that's what I think the other thing we need, popping briefly back to chat GPT, is remembering that you're reverting to the mean when you use it to write. You know, you're just getting the sum of everything else that's out there to some extent. Um, and that is probably not, you know, if you want to elevate above as you do, you will need to make changes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Which is the authentic voice, how to develop the authentic voice. Yeah. 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 Oh, fun. <laughs> Don't miss out. <laughs> yeah. Don't tune yeah. away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, you've, I believe you've got a book coming out soon on, on developing your authentic voice or I kind do. of the authentic voice. Yeah, I do. Um, I have a, 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 a book on the writer's voice. The writer's voice is what's called nice and okay. simple Excellent. coming out this summer. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I set out to write a book and I did a whole bunch of research and I just had, you know, as I think maybe we're similar, we like to dive into the research on things. Yeah. Um, and I realized as I was working on the outline and all this, I said, you know what? People can read about voice all they want, but it won't make any difference. I've got to make it more interactive. So I changed course and I made it, a, it's a hybrid book workbook. It has as many sort of experiments to try because mm -hmm. I can't tell, you know, I can't tell you what your voice is, but yeah. I can tell you play at these two ends of the extreme and see what feels comfortable to you. That That's a fun, a really fun thing to do. So, um, so that's what that's about. I think it will be fun. I sure had fun creating it and doing all the exercises myself and testing them on other people. And um, so if you like to mess around with this stuff, that will be available later this summer. Yeah. And um, for those people in the Southern Hemisphere, that's winter. So oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got to remember that. We're talking <laughs> what, August, September? August, September. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly. Probably yeah. August. I should be clear. Seasons. 
Excellent. Yeah. And and we're in 2023 now, in case you're listening to this um, later on, because all of these episodes and all of this fantastic information that uh, Anne has shared with us, of course, is timeless. So you timeless. might want to come back and revisit <laughs> this, in which case, go check out the book. It's already published. <laughs> it's like a time machine. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, this is fabulous, Anne. I could talk on and talk out for ages on um, content and, and in particular the whole idea of chat GPT. One, one of the things I did want to ask you, because I know we had a brief conversation on this around in our um, Get to Know You call, and mm-hmm. it was about this whole, uh, well, the whole idea around the ethical considerations. Now, the most obvious one, I suppose, is if I say to ChatGPT, hey, write me an article or a blog post on XYZ, and I then take that as is, publish it, there's a very high chance that that will contain some plagiarized material. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. How, do you, how do you copyright that? I don't, you know, I, I don't Yeah, know well, how do you, co- well, how do I copyright that? How, how do I assign um, ownership? But what, how do you yeah. see this whole ethical stuff playing out because there's a whole lot more than just just that that I think that opens up a kind of a Pandora's box <laughs> it does it does especially as you see actually people writing and publishing books using it um uh you know uh if you're like if you're using it as a brainstorming buddy and getting outlines and going on and writing it's still your work if you're just putting it out um there are a lot of ethical things, and I don't think we've necessarily figured that out, which is why I would proceed on the side of caution. Hmm. Um, so I actually have have put, and I've seen another writer do this, and I can't think of who it was, um, but he actually has a, a AI policy on his website saying, this is how I use it, but everything, all the words here I've written are you know, revised heavily. Um, I think that's an interesting way to do it. I, I think we need to be transparent about how we're using it, um, if we're using it. Uh, because right there, there's legal issues that, you know, our, our regulatory and legal systems are slow moving and the technology is fast moving. So what we have is this gap and I don't want to be stuck in the gap if it closes in on us quickly. Right. No one does. Um, but the same thing I, I care about perhaps, you know, as equally as much as the trust issue, uh, well, certainly for me, I mean, I'm a, a writing coach and giving writing advice. So if I abdicate writing, I'm not much of a coach. Am yeah, yeah. I? And that's kind of not a good thing. However, I do think that, you know, I'll, I, if I have working with someone whose English isn't their first language, it's like, you know, chat or AI has been a part of grammar tools for a long time. Run it through, have it fix your prepositions because in- prepositions in English are a minefield. So Yes, let AI take care of that for you. That's an honest use of it. Just having it clean up your, hmm. you know, your language and find your grammar problems, things like that. Totally honest and and legitimate, and and it benefits the reader because what you come out with is clean, cleaner. Yeah. So yeah. High yeah. quality to read. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wrote I wrote an article recently because I've used it in, um, actually as a brainstorming tool as you mentioned earlier an example as a brainstorming tool to um, analyze my business model for my community building and then asked it to give me further ideas and then yeah. turned around and said can you cr- okay here's here's the business model now that we've come up with can you please pull this to pieces wow with, you know with black hat thinking, kind of using the de bono terminology, and give me everything that will can go wrong with this, and be really hypercritical, and wow. it gave me about a dozen things that I'd thought of. Perhaps three of those, um, three of those I was aware of, and thought, yeah, I'll, go, I'll have to think about how I address those, how I mitigate or avoid those. Uh, but the other nine I hadn't thought of. And huh. some of them were trivial, probably half of them were trivial, uh, but the other half had the potential to be quite significant. And then I turned around and, and said, okay, give me an action plan for how I mitigate all these 12 and what to do. And there were some overlaps in some of the actions that were suggested. So I said, oh, well, that, that's good. Now let's build this back into the original plan. 
And uh, after I'd done all that and I actually built landing pages and I built email campaigns and I built um, the strategy around that and some of the actions that mitigate those potential risks. And I thought, I should write this up as a case study. And I did that using ChatGPT and wrote a blog post from that. Now, the blog post um, is probably like the first draft was ChatGPT with my yeah. input. Um, yeah. And then we, and then I would have done about another five drafts until the final yeah. one. But when I published that, I said um, this, uh, when in the author box, I put my name in <laughs> Collaboration with ChatGPT in the author. That's box. great. <laughs> so you were transparent about it while you yeah, were sharing yeah. it. And that's 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 you know that's brilliant. Yeah. I, you know I think this kind of thoughtful and creative exploration of what it does is fantastic, and that that is a really inspiring study. So I'm going to make note of that one. That's fantastic. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Be transparent. Be thoughtful. You know, that's that's all we can do. There's certainly, like you said, taking content you've already created and spinning out like different versions of it, or even spinning out social media posts based on it and all this. This is just kind of busy work writing and yeah, that yeah. would be a totally legitimate thing. You're working from your content, all of that. That's a different story than just having it answer your emails for you. Yeah, yeah. Something. Well, one, <laughs> one of the ones I do all the time now, I thought oh, this is going to be really good for this because I've got a couple of call to action that I put into the podcast episodes for the mm -hmm. intro and the outro in every episode. And there's a standard text, um, but it's actually inserted into my intro. So I'll, for this episode, for example, I'll say, hey, on this episode, we've got uh, Anne Janser and and do a bit of an introduction, a little bit more than I did in the live conversation. And I will then say, stay tuned, because in this conversation, we talk about A, B and C. So I usually mm -hmm. pull out three. Um, in the middle of that, I will have a call to action to go and check out our Flywheel Nation community. And that's a standard text. And I read out the same text each time. And sometimes I think, oh, I wonder if I sound really boring because I'm reading yeah. out the same text. So what I've started doing now is I take the text from the last episode, stick it into chat GPT and say, give me another way of saying this. And Great. Yeah. And then Great. it'll come back and then I'll just modify it a little bit um, to yeah. make it sound like me, um, but it's actually, it's given me a prompt to, okay, how can I say this differently? To some extent, you know, it's replicating the way that we learn language, which mm. is listening to and modeling off of other people. So yeah, of, yeah. of course it's a totally legitimate to use it in that way, learn mm. from and model off or modeling off a, a model of other people. I mean, it's just, it's just one layer yeah, removed, yeah. I guess, um, which is what makes it so fascinating. So these are all great uses. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I love uh, it. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it like that. It's um, allowing us to model off a model of other people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. My head's going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks, Anne. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. The same five questions I ask of every guest. And the idea okay. is you'll inspire the listener to take some action as a result of your answers today. Okay. So what's the number I'm one? ready. <laughs> Great. What's the number one thing in, anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Step away from the desk. <laughs> Step <laughs> away from the desk. Best take a walk outside with someone who works in an entirely different industry than you because creativity is nonlinear thinking. It's going, innovation is looking across domains and we can't do that when we're buried in our to-do list. We just yeah. can't, not going to happen. Yeah, I love it. And it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? Uh, particularly from a productivity point of view, that taking those sort of breaks and, and switching off completely from the to-do list and going out into a different area can actually make us much more productive. And, and like you say, it, it certainly sparks different ideas. Yes, it absolutely does. And that's really the, the secret to it. Yeah. Hmm. Cultivating it. All right. What's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? So what I've had to do is teach myself, give myself permission to question established wisdom, because I'm kind of a, normally maybe used to be a rule follower. A, I love best practices. Um, but in a rapidly changing world, last year's best practices may not be what you want to be doing. So I give myself permission to 
question the assumptions and experiment if I'm not sure uh, of something and, and give myself permission to fail, I think, in the experiments too. And I think, so it's a mindset, mindset mm. shift. Mm. I love it. So the taking an approach of um, let's do an experiment and if it doesn't turn out as I hypothesized, that's all right. I've learned something. It's not <laughs> exactly. Failure. It's not failure. It's actually a learning. Mm. That's right. Mm. That's Wonderful. Right. All right. Do you have a favorite resource you use most often? A uh, favorite resource for innovating or for, yeah. Um, I'll, my, one of my very favorite tricks that I do daily, daily to work through problems or get ideas is free writing. It's, you know, you need a pen and a paper, piece of paper <laughs> um, and to make yourself write fluidly without judgment uh, about a topic, I discover that I have many more answers in my head than I realize I did. And maybe mm. some other really fantastic questions. So that's a, that's something anyone can do anytime. Mm. Yeah. It takes a bit of discipline. I, I guess if you get into the habit, it's probably one of those things like a muscle that you need to build if you, the more you do yeah. it. The, yeah. The, but if you the, find yourself, here's a, here's an entry into it. If you find yourself going, ah, you know, I don't know what I'm going to talk about in this thing, or I don't know what to do. Anytime you have that, that's time. Go pick up the paper, step away from the desk, do it somewhere else, and 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 just make yourself write five hundred words on it and see what happens. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing what happens. Actually, it's amazing. Yeah, and actually, I found um, it's okay to start with writing down. I, I've got no idea what I'm going to write about here, and yeah, and then just yeah. keep going with whatever thoughts come up. Yeah, yeah. Because usually, yeah, what I find. When I do that, usually what I'll go on to next is something like, initially I thought this was going to be about X, um, but then I started to have doubts. And so then, you know, I can explore my feelings. Uh, and yeah, then I changed yeah. my mind and thought maybe Y is a better topic. And then I yeah. hesitated on that. Now, why am I hesitating on that? So it's kind of like... <laughs> Dig into it. It's mm. it's deep thought. We don't give ourselves permission to just think deeply. So uh, if you have a pen and paper and you're doing something, that's your permission to do it. That's, yeah. I think, the power of free, free writing. Yeah, <laughs> is yeah. It gives you, look, I'm doing something physical. I'm doing something busy. Mm. And that's how you think deeply. Yeah. Mm. Love it. All right. <laughs> now, what's the best way to keep a client on track? Um, so to keep on track, um, I find it most useful for to keep clients on track by focusing on who they're serving and why, because usually when people go off track, it's because um, either they're distracted by a shiny object or, um, or they're, they're, there's some doubt or fear that's distracting them. Um, there's a moment often right before someone's about to publish a book where like people are ready to scrap the thing. <laughs> it's like, no, don't do this. Um, and it's a really common thing. It's the imposter syndrome comes roaring in. It's mm -hmm. like, let's stop. Let's talk about, think about that person who's going to benefit so much from this book. Once they get out of their heads, they tend to stay on track. So that's, that's my trick there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that's fantastic. And it's, um, it's like we were saying before, often we're so much in our heads, right? That um, We are. Of yeah. course, we live in our heads, and so we need constant reminders to get out of them, just constant. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the paradox is that whilst we think all the time about, oh, what are people going to think of me? Do they like what I've written if it's a book? Do they like my photograph that's on the cover? Do, you know, do do I look good on the photograph in my cover? Do, should I take my glasses? Will I look better with my glasses <laughs> off or glasses on, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And the reality is that the person who's the reader who has the book in front of them is giving not a skerrick of thought to how you look nope. <laughs> or nope. what, how you've expressed the words. All they're worried about is oh, gee, this is amazing content and oh, I can yes. really do something with this or this is going to transform my life. That's what they're worried about. That's so true. I mean, it's. I think they, psychologists call that the spotlight effect. We think the spotlight's always on us and of course it's not. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. All right. Finally, heads. in the buzz round, what's the number one thing anyone could do to differentiate themselves? So probably, you know, what I'm going to say here is going to go back and think about the relationships you have with people, because that's, uh, that's where we're different and how you show up and your voice and the way you behave, your values, 
those are things that are hard for other people to replicate. And those are your real, real business differentiators. You know, other people may do the same thing you do as well as you do, hmm. but the relationship that your client or customer is going to have is going to be different with you than with them. And when you focus on that, it actually helps you attract, I think, the right kinds of mm-hmm. customers, the right kinds of clients. Um, so, yeah, own it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. Uh, the The idea, certainly the relationship is something that can't be replicated by somebody yeah. else. Um, yeah. But to look at it from a point of view, if you really own that, and if you really make that part of your brand voice, if you like, what we've been mm-hmm. talking about, um, you attract more of those people that you can build those relate those really good relationships with rather than uh, somebody else who you might take on board and who it's really hard work to, estab- to establish and then maintain that level yeah. of relationship with. Yeah, we're not the right fit for everybody. None, none mm-hmm. of us are the right fit for everybody. And so everyone's happier if we just kind of focus on that that sweet spot of the relationships that are going to work well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Excellent. True. Well, fantastic, Anne. Um, now, where can people reach out to you to find out more about the work you do and also maybe even get in touch to say thanks for what you've shared today? Oh, I'd love to hear from any of your listeners. Um, you can find me at my website, which is annjanzer.com, A-N-N-E, there's a silent E, janzer.com. Um, and my website is simply Anne at Ann Janzer. My, my website, my email is Anne at Ann Janzer.com. So I'd love to hear from any of you. Um, I do have, I was going to share with your listeners, if any of any of one listening is thinking about writing a book, I did a survey a couple of years ago of more than 400 nonfiction authors, and they all shared their experiences of what writing, what the experience was like for them, what they learned. Um, and I have those survey revol- results. If you're interested, uh, I'll share a link and you can download them and, and read that. You might find it you might find it fascinating if you're thinking of doing a book. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll have those links in the show notes so people can click through and get in touch with you and also download that uh, survey, uh, those survey results and find out more about Great. that. Great. Thanks, Jurgen. All right, finally, and what uh, action would you like our listener to take away from today's conversation? Well, I'm going to just challenge you all to do that little email trick that I shared early on. When you write your next email, go back before you hit send and look at the first sentence or two. And if it begins with I, <laughs> change it to you. Just see what that does, just as an experiment, as part of my experimental mindset, see what that does. And if you think how you think it will land differently with the person who opens it. Hmm. Excellent. Well, that's a very clear call to action. And um, I look forward to hearing back from our listeners what what they experience from that. And please copy in yeah. Anne on, on your feedback. I'm sure she I'd love, love to know. Mm. Love to know. I know it works wonders for me. So. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights so generously today, Anne. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Could have spoken for another several hours, <laughs> um, but not sure everybody wanted to listen for that long. Uh, so maybe we're up for another session sometime in the near future as things like ChatGPT and the other AI tools are around evolve because they're evolving so quickly, as you said. And Yeah. Um, yeah. But Great. By all means, I'd love please to come stay back. in touch. Okay, for sure. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Anne.